Well, hello there, boils and ghouls and non-binary werewolves. It's that special time of year again when I slap... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, something in my throat. It's that special time of year again, when a slime's thoughts turn towards witches and bats and haunted houses and Draculas. We have a yearly tradition here at Thought Slime Incorporated, where we look at a horror movie each Halloween, which started before I had a separate channel where I only discuss horror movies. Luckily for me, I had something special saved up, something that fits a bit better on this channel. A series of films that I have no interest in covering on Scaredy Cats because of how much my politics would bleed into the discussion. I'm referring, of course, to the Maniac Cop series of feature films. Now, for the uninitiated, the Maniac Cop is on a quest for vengeance, and he can't be stopped, and that, you see, is why they call him the Maniac Cop. Now, once upon a time he was a super cop, but the bad guys framed him to make him stop. They put him in prison where they tried to kill him, but he broke out, now he's the villain. Bullets don't hurt him, and I know this sounds like jive, but we're not sure if he's dead or alive. At least, that's according to the Maniac Cop rap from Maniac Cop 2, which, amazingly, is a real thing and not a joke that I made up. The films follow the misadventures of a slightly less murderous than average police officer second time I've gotten to use that joke. But get this, get this everybody, he's killing indiscriminately rather than, you know, very discriminately, like they normally do. Matt Cordell, the series villain, is a slasher with a cop gimmick, a hulking monster of a man with superhuman strength and endurance, and eventually, a voodoo-powered zombie who becomes completely bulletproof and maybe invulnerable. The tone is more than a little tongue-in-cheek, as you can guess, especially as the series goes on. Now, these are very silly movies meant to be just another in a long line of gonzo slashers from the 80s. This isn't some highfalutin, heady satire. It's just a movie about a cop who goes around killing people. And with a premise like that, you'd think that these films might grapple with police brutality, especially viewing this from 2020, when police brutality is kind of having a moment. Either that or, you know, they just completely ignore it so as not to offend anybody. Either conservatives who don't want to acknowledge police brutality, or humans who, you know, want the subject matter to be treated respectfully and not made the focus of a goofy horror movie. Instead, these movies choose the worst of both worlds and address police brutality, but never really let the characters discuss it so that it just lingers over the movie like a ghost. You'll see what I mean. So the first movie, opens with a bartender walking home alone at night. Two random guys pop out of nowhere to mug her, but she resists and they get violent. In the distance, she sees the silhouette of a police officer and runs to him for help. She explains that two Puerto Rican guys attacked her. Not those guys. She has to specifically mention that they're Puerto Rican. These two Puerto Rican guys just try to mug me. <laughs> but the thing is, it's not a regular cop, it's the maniac cop. So instead of brutally murdering the suspected criminals, he attempts to brutally murder the victim via strangulation. So, okay, this scene is really jarring to me, viewing it uh, in the lens of 2020. The way that a white woman runs to a white police officer and specifically invokes the race of the other two men to him, it's a little bit too close to the way that several social media videos have shown white women doing this in real life. Like to Christian Cooper, the bird watcher in Central Park, who was threatened by an angry white lady with police. It's hard for me to read the scene as anything other than this woman trying to get these two guys killed for racist reasons. And I don't think the film intended this reading, because for one, there were no social media videos like that at the time, and for another, the two Puerto Rican guys actually did try to mug and hurt her. The uncomfortable truth is that the movie took it for granted that the audience would register that the white cop would save the white lady from the dangerous minorities so that it could subvert that expectation by having the cop turn out to be a killer. Not so much as a statement on police violence or racial profiling, but just as a bit of dramatic irony. So we're not off to a great start. Matt Cordell, the titular maniac cop, was put in prison for an undisclosed crime implied in this film to be brutality. Now, nobody comes right out and says that, but he's called a legend for his take-no-shit attitude. He's described as having been a shoot-first-and-ask-questions-later kind of guy. And in the first movie, at least, this is presented as a demonstration that there was always something wrong with Cordell. 
Later movies would celebrate this brutality. Cordell, a cop, is naturally targeted in prison and gets violently attacked, allowing him to fake his own death, but in the process, he's horribly disfigured or maybe literally killed and reanimated? It is not clear. Anyway, he escapes and goes around killing people in a police uniform to make people distrust the police, and then starts killing high-ranking police officers to get revenge on the crooked system. The Big Shot Commissioner, played by Richard Roundtree, the original Shaft, tries to cover it up to prevent a mass panic or ruin the department's reputation or something or other. Plucky detective Frank McRae, played by Tom Atkins from Halloween 3 and Night of the Creeps, blabs to the press anyway. People start getting freaked out and assuming random uniformed police are the maniac cop. An old lady shoots fire at an officer trying to help her with engine troubles, for example. Which is weird, right? Because that kind of implies the hero, McRae, was naive to give the info to the press and that the crooked commissioner was right. People are panicky and impulsive and police, as a consequence of their sensitive work, have to withhold some info from them. Now don't get me wrong, the commish is still framed as villainous and McRae is noble and idealistic, but it's weird that the situation seems to be making the argument that police need less transparency. Furthermore, if people started blasting the police away every time one of them went around killing people, there would never have been police. They kill people a lot. The maniac cop tries to frame Jack Forrest, played by Bruce Campbell, because of the uncanny resemblance between them. You know, how Bruce Campbell looks like Robert Zadar? Two men who are in no way famous for their incredibly distinct chins. Forrest is arrested under suspicion of being the maniac cop, and all the other cops immediately abandon him and presume he's guilty. And I think this presents a very rosy view of police culpability for crimes they commit. In real life, cops are seldom charged for crimes. Other cops tend to back up their comrades and enforce the blue wall of silence if they are. Police unions advocate vociferously for the defense of any cop accused of a crime, and in the few examples where they do get charged, there exist a variety of legal loopholes to get them out of trouble. Take, for example, qualified immunity. If a cop is found to have used excessive force, they can argue that they had no way of knowing their actions were illegal. How are they supposed to perform their job duties while keeping up to date with the minutia of legal precedent? From Reuters, Reuters? Reuters? In an unprecedented analysis of appellate court reports, Reuters found that since 2005, the courts have shown an increasing tendency to grant immunity in excessive force cases rulings that the district courts below them must follow. This trend has accelerated in recent years. Reuters found among the cases it analyzed, more than three dozen in which qualified immunity protected officers whose actions had been deemed unlawful. Outside of Dallas, Texas, five officers fired 17 shots at a bicyclist who was 100 yards away killing him in a case of mistaken identity. In Herber City, Utah, an officer threw to the ground an unarmed man he had pulled over for a cracked windshield, leaving the man with brain damage. In Prince George's County, Maryland, an officer shot a man in a mental health crisis who was stabbing himself and trying to slit his own throat. Well, how was I supposed to know you couldn't shoot someone while they're trying to slit their own throat? Now granted, those are usually crimes that they commit in active duty, while Forrest was accused of being a serial killer in his off hours, so I'm reaching a little bit here. But I still think the idea that the other cops would accept the weight of evidence against Forrest and work to apprehend him? A little naive. Anyway, he escapes and kills the maniac cop, or does he? No, he does not. The maniac cop is fine. So, in Maniac Cop 2, Cordell's plans are a little more complicated, and also are complete nonsense. He kills off the remaining characters from the first movie, and we're introduced to newer, less sympathetic characters. And given that Bruce Campbell's character shrugs off his wife getting murdered just after discovering that he was having an affair with a co-worker, that's saying something. Detective McKinney, played by Robert Davi, is introduced needlessly killing a random criminal, and then shrugging it off. He's sent to police counseling, where he meets our secondary lead, Susan Riley, a police psychologist, which evidently means she is both a police and a psychologist. McKinney explains his actions thusly. I feel great about what I did. If you want to psychoanalyze someone, why don't you psychoanalyze the lawyers and judges who put that kind of scum back on the streets? Okay, 
There is this common trope in fiction about the police, the idea that the lenient justice system is letting bad guys off the hook, and if cops could just cut through the red tape a little bit, that could stem the tide of violent crime. But the bureaucrats up in their ivory towers who don't know what it's like on the streets with these animals won't let them. Firstly, the incarceration rate in the United States has been surging since the 80s, despite violent crime also declining during that period. And no doubt some of you right now are standing up in your chairs, hooting and hollering, saying, Aha! Thought Slime. If the incarceration rate is going up and the violent crime rate is going down, doesn't that imply that being tougher on crime is working? Yum yum yum, I love to eat shit, you would then go on to say. No, for one thing. Correlation does not imply causation. Secondly, if that were true, one would expect the rate of incarceration to fall as the crime rate did, but it turns out, get this, it doesn't. It's not doing that. One might also expect that the rise in incarceration would come from violent offenders, but the rise in incarceration far exceeds the total number of violent offenders. So that can't be the case. Also, other countries, like for example, the one I live in, managed to have decently low crime rates, lower than the US, without having the world's largest prison population, so it feels like propping up mass incarceration is the only solution to this problem is wishful thinking for people who like the idea of being tough on crime for its own sake rather than because it's sound policy. Secondly, corrupt defense attorneys aren't letting criminals walk scot-free. Putting aside that having a defense is the cornerstone of the justice system, the overwhelming majority of defendants do not go to trial. In the overwhelming majority of cases, they are coerced into taking plea bargains and agreeing to serve a sentence for a crime they may not have committed rather than risk a worse sentence. And thirdly, even if the justice system were rigged in favor of criminals, somehow, that wouldn't make it okay to summarily execute them on the streets. And if a guy is saying, actually, I like killing people who I think deserve it, that guy should not be given the power to do that. That's a bad idea. Now, in the movie's defense, it does kind of criticize these violent tendencies in the police. The film ends with McRae opining that, in the end, there's not that much difference between a cop and a maniac cop. Finally, the movie said the common saying that you and I as leftists all know, all cops are maniac cops. There's a piece of cordell in every cop. Every time arresting some mutt isn't enough because we know they'll be back on the streets before we even do the paperwork. Every time we pull a trigger, and it feels good, because that's something the lawyers can't reverse. It all comes down to justice and pressure. There's only that much difference between a cop and a maniac cop. Okay, so they're acknowledging how easily someone with that much power and equipped to do so much violence can become dangerous. But the thing is, is that he arrived at this conclusion out of sympathy for the maniac cop. See, in this movie, it's revealed that Cordell wasn't arrested for brutality or whatever. He took the fall for the new police commissioner's corruption. The brutality, you see, was him being a good cop. It's repeatedly stressed that Cordell was a good cop. We're the guilty ones. Cordell, you were a good man once. A good cop. He's even given a funeral with honors, and the priest giving his eulogy tells us we can't judge him for the weakness imposed on him by his humanity, but we should instead judge the people who framed him. We cannot sit in judgment of this man any more than we might sit in judgment of those responsible for his false imprisonment and untimely demise. Please forgive whatever sins he may have committed through human weakness. You know, the guy who repeatedly killed innocent people for no reason, strangled women, killed a whole bunch of people, like an entire precinct worth of people. Can't judge him. It's the guy who did some kind of unnamed corruption. He's the problem. It's worth noting that in Maniac Cop 2, Cordell has a sidekick, a serial killer who kills strippers, and who is the most repulsive and annoying character imaginable. The serial killer is arrested, so Cordell orchestrates a jailbreak and then a classic reverse jailbreak where he breaks criminals into prison to either kill the criminals who attacked him when he was alive or free the criminals in, that are in the prison already for some purpose. It is not 
His plan is not explained in any kind of detail. People just kind of speculate about what he's doing. It's never revealed. Either way, the criminals all go along with it, because in the world of Maniac Cop, every criminal is part of some kind of parallel crime society, willing to put aside their differences and work together if it means the opportunity to do more crimes, which they just love to do. They love doing crimes, and that's why the crimes happen. They don't need a better reason than that. Criminals are uniformly malicious and sadistic. People who could function in the normal world, but choose to become criminals to get easy money or whatever. They're not people trapped by desperate circumstances like poverty or drug addiction. They're always gleeful monsters. The one exception to this rule, of course, is Matt Cordell. You see, he has a reason for his crimes. He believed in the institution of policing, and it let him down. He was a good cop who hurt people very badly like he was supposed to, and he still got screwed over. That drove him to his crime, you see. That very human weakness. But some guy robbing a convenience store? Scum. A soulless monster. Less than human. Long story short, the maniac cop dies in a fire, or does he? No, he's fine. Because, you see, and this makes sense, this is, this is where I would expect this story to go, is a voodoo priest resurrected him. I've been putting it off as long as I can, but we must now discuss Maniac Cop 3, Badge of Silence. And when you see that name, you know you're in for quality. For those of you that don't know, Alan Smithy is the pseudonym used when a director refuses to be credited on a film, and it's not a good sign. I don't know what a badge of silence is. I know the blue wall of silence, and I know about badges, but I don't know why they named this movie Badge of Silence. Because when you Google it, it just returns this movie. So I don't know, was Badge of Silence an expression before this? So in this movie, we're introduced to Katie Sullivan, a younger cop who's a little sister type figure for McKinney. It's her birthday, but she's so dedicated to her work that she's at the shooting range and she's an amazing shot and just... Can you guess what happens to her? Can you tell already? She tries to stop a robbery at a pharmacy and gets shot when it's revealed that the cashier was in on the robbery somehow. The police, you see, can't trust the victims of a violent crime. They should be tense and nervous and ready to blow away anyone at a moment's notice. So then she's in a coma. Wow. What pathos for McKinney, who's always been her protector. You've always been her protector. Please make sure she gets the best of care. Even though we didn't see her at all in the previous film with this character, so we're just meeting her now, kind of feels like this is all cheap emotional manipulation designed to tug at your heartstrings and... Oh, hey, Grumble Tom. What a cute little costume. What are you, some kind of kitty cat? Oh, sorry, buddy. I don't have any candy for you. <laughs> Maybe the audience has some likes and subscriptions or Patreon donations to feed you. Folks, help me, help me out here. Help me fill up Grumble Tum's little candy sack and give him a happy Halloween. Okay, bye. Anyway, these two Nightcrawler types videotaped Katie's shooting, and they edited the footage to make her look like she was using excessive force. And the media runs with it because, of course, the lying media is always out to get the police. And a pretty blonde cop? There's nothing the media hates more than that. And then, the Nightcrawlers... They say this. What do you suppose would happen if we showed that cop shooting in full? Like how? I mean, like, you know, don't cut out the stuff that we usually cut out. Yeah, look at this way. Cop brutality sells. Okay? Just ask Rodney. So just in case you're, uh, you're too young to remember this, Rodney King was an African-American man who was badly beaten by police officers in 1991 during a traffic stop for driving under the influence. The cops who participated were acquitted, because they always are, and that led to the 1992 LA riots. And if all of that sounds weirdly familiar here in 2020, it's because time is a flat circle and we will never learn our lessons. Having these two Nightcrawlers discuss this in relation to their own fictional edited footage heavily implies that the coverage of Rodney King's assault was likewise sensationalistic on the part of the media. You know, when they showed a videotape of the thing that happened. Anyway, turns out Katie brought a fucking Uzi to the robbery. And then McKinney explains it like this. Christ's sake, Willie, you've been on the streets. Every hitter out there's got that and more. What are we supposed to fight them back with, huh? Pop guns? Don't matter. Those are legal weapons. Cops can't use them. You know that, I know that, she knows that. Scumbag knows that. Yeah, man, totally. The police, 
need to have continuously escalating arsenals or else they won't possess the overwhelming force to subdue the criminal element. They're out there dealing with guys throwing bottles at them and they're supposed to defend themselves with just tanks and helicopters and bulletproof vests and tear gas grenades and SWAT teams and tasers and nightsticks and attack dogs and body armors and APCs. Keep in mind that the plot of this whole movie hinges on exonerating Katie for the charge of excessive force. But she did bring an illegal automatic weapon to a gunfight that she herself instigated. So it kind of seems like maybe she did do that. Maybe there was, maybe there, she was doing excessive force a little bit. The guy who shot her, by the way, also played by a young Jackie Earl Haley, that's kind of neat. He's looking to cash in on the whole thing. He's suing the police department. His corrupt court-appointed public defender wants to get his felony charges expunged so that he can write a book about his experiences. The mayor or something, I don't know what this guy's job is, he goes along with it because he has the hots for the lawyer. And then Cordell sets a bunch of the hospital criminals free, like from the crime wing of the hospital. And naturally, they start killing everybody because they're criminals and that's crime. So that's what criminals do. One of them kills the lawyer and then we get this lovely exchange. Great, I shot my lawyer. Fuck him, get another one, they're free. Because you see, these animals don't appreciate their lawyers because they got them for free. We shouldn't be giving people lawyers just because our oppositional justice system only functions if they have lawyers. We should just convict everyone accused of a crime and then that won't create any problems. Anyway, you're probably wondering why the voodoo priest brought back the maniac cop. It's because these are dark times and dark times required... Um... I don't know why he did it. It's, they don't explain it. You are the first cop to walk these streets in a long time. These are dark days, my friend. And I need your very special kind of darkness. Anyway, Katie dies, but Cordell is now in love with her for some reason. So he brings Katie to the voodoo guy to get him to reanimate her, but her soul doesn't want to come back to life, so he can't do it. And then, he get, and then the maniac cop gets set on fire and exploded, finally destroying him forever. Or did it? No, he's fine. So, okay. Look, I'm not going to pretend like these movies are really relevant at all. I think it's fair to say that nobody is getting their ideas of police or police work from the Maniac Cop series of feature films. I don't think anybody would look at them as realistic depictions of cops or crime. But I do think that looking how they portray both demonstrates their latent attitudes towards cops and crime. By Maniac Cop 3, it's full-on conservative agitprop, pretending as though cops are these malign defenders of crime-riddled, ungrateful streets. But the very fact that the films are about a maniac cop, and that's meant to be shocking, kind of show that's not true. The entire premise of the movie hinges on the audience thinking of cops as something non-threatening, something that wouldn't hurt them. And I don't want to make it sound like I don't like these movies. I do, except for number three, which is boring and doesn't make any sense. The others, though, they're fun, especially Maniac Cop 2, which I think is very underrated. I think it's probably one of the best action horrors of the 80s. Highly watchable. Great time. And the copaganda in these movies isn't unique to the Maniac Cop series of films. It's the product of a larger media landscape that lionizes cops and demonizes criminals, that makes crime look like an individual moral failure rather than the inevitable result of shitty policy, that makes cops look like brave heroes rather than the vanguards of the violent status quo, that views any sort of journalism or media coverage of police wrongdoing as inherently invasive and obstructing them from the work of keeping us all safe. But this attitude is everywhere. Cops are the de facto good guys in movies and TV. They're the guys who the government says is allowed to do violence. And since we all want to see violence in our movies and shows, they end up being the focus. So even with mindless entertainment like this, I think it's worthwhile to take a deeper look and ask ourselves what assumptions it's making about police and crime and whether those assumptions should be taken for granted. Oh, okay, I'm done. You guys want to see uh, my jack-o'-lantern? Pretty happy with how it came out. They didn't have um, any of the pumpkin carving kits at, at the dollar store, so I had to do it with this kitchen knife. Uh, but I, I think it turned out pretty good. Um, here. It's an eyeball. 
Trick or treat and welcome to the eyeball zone. Here in the eyeball zone, instead of candy, we give eyeballs to small leftist projects in need of your attention. Now, Acolytes of Horror is a little bit of a bigger project than we typically extend our eyeballs to, but his review of The Lighthouse, my favorite movie of last year, was so brilliant and thought-provoking and relevant that I had to bring it to your attention. It doesn't hurt either that he himself eyeballs Kay and Skittles towards the end of his video, so he gets it, you know? Anyway, his video is all about the class struggle taking place at the heart of the lighthouse, something I completely missed in my own analysis of the film over at my second channel, Scaredy Cats. He relates it back to his own work experiences and the lies at the heart of the American dream. And just go watch it, I'm not going to do it justice, it's great. Also, he has a video where he outlines why Return of the Jedi, my favorite Star Wars movie, rules, despite the criticism it usually gets. Check it out! Do you have a small leftist project you'd like to see featured here on the Eyeball Zone? Send no more than one email to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with the word eyeballs listed somewhere in the description and pertinent details like your pronouns and perhaps you will find yourself trapped here in the Eyeball Zone. Now let me just get the calls to action out of the way. Please like and subscribe and go to patreon.com slash thoughtslime. Give me some money. Okay, we're done. Now, I would like to perform for you the Maniac Cop rap. <clears throat> You better watch out when you hear that sound. It means that the maniac cops around. Once upon a time, he was a super cop, but the bad guys framed him to make him stop. They put him in prison where they tried to kill him, but he broke out, now he's the villain. Bullets don't hurt him? I know it sounds like jive, but we're not sure if he's dead or alive. Set him on fire? Shoot him with an Uzi. But he'll show up in your jacuzzi. You can run him over, you can feed him poison, push him out a window and it only annoys him. You better believe me, if you think I'm lying, when he show up, people start dying. He's out for vengeance and he can't be stopped. That's why they call him the Maniac Cop. When you hear that whistle out in the street, you're going to think it's a cop on the beat. But don't be thinking about police protection because this is one cop with a bad connection. When he shows up, he's supposed to protect you, but the maniac cop is out to get you. He's an anti-vigilante and they can't convict him because watch out, Jack, you're the next victim. Don't hang around if you see him coming. Just pick up your feet and commence to running. Don't waste your time dialing 911. Forget karate. Forget your gun. Don't play hero and don't try to be brave. This dude is going to send you to an early grave. He's out for vengeance and he can't be stopped. That's why they call him the Maniac Cop. The law is evil and justice is blind, but this cop's justice is one of a kind. He's homicidal and maladjusted, but when he busts in, your ass is busted. You won't get a ticket or pay a fine. You might as well be dealing with Frankenstein. He's big and ugly with a busted jaw. You know he's the wrong arm of the law. Better stay away from this man in blue and don't call the cops because he'll knock them too. They killed him once, but then he came back. He's the mama, 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 maniac. When you're out on the street and you hear that sound, it probably means that Cordell's around. He's out for vengeance and he can't be stopped. That's why they call him the maniac cop. Have a safe Halloween, everybody.